Hello everyone and welcome to week three of your physics lectures at Physics 221 here at Grantham University. This week we move on to magnetism, electromagnetic induction, and Faraday's law. So magnetism is very closely related to electricity. For years they actually thought they were two separate um, physical phenomena, but it turns out they're actually one and the same. Um, this is a fundamental quantity and it's created primarily by currents, although there are other, other ways to create it. And the two main types of currents that create these are electromagnets and then what we call permanent magnets. Permanent magnets are interesting because what this is, is this is where the individual magnetic moments of the atoms have actually mostly aligned in a material so that there's a net magnetic field for the object. Most material that people interact with on a daily basis, the magnetic moments are randomly aligned. Every atom has a magnetic moment, meaning it's like a little bitty magnet, but for the most part they're randomly aligned. In materials that contain large amounts of iron, these can be aligned in a way to stay that way, and such that the net magnetic field for the entire object is much larger than average objects, which they average out to zero. Now we can also see that you, there are magnetic forces similar to Coulomb's law, uh, specifically a current carrying wire and an external magnetic field will be a force, and it also depends on the direction. Notice I have the current as a vector there. It can be either positive or negative, and that actually changes the direction. Now the other thing to note here is this is a cross product between the current direction and the magnetic field, which means the direction of the force is actually perpendicular both to the current direction and the magnetic field. So let's look at an electromagnetic induction example. So I'm um, pulling a common example over here. We have a 9.6 centimeter diameter circular loop of wire. This is an external 1.1 tesla magnetic field. The loop is removed from the field in 0 um, 0.15 seconds. There we go. A little easier to see that. And then we want to know what is the average induced EMF. So again, we're looking at a system here where there are no um, charges, uh, no voltages. We're just having a magnetic field and uh, a loop of wire changing somehow. I mean, you can always in create an induced EMF by either changing the the angle of the field, changing the flux through it, or changing the intensity of the magnetic field. So basically by moving the wire out of the loop, what we're doing in this case is we are actually changing the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the changing the magnetic flux through it. So we assume that the plane of the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Otherwise, um, that's the change of the angle, and if it's parallel, it's going to give us nothing. So then the magnitude of the average induced EMF is given by Faraday's laws as such. The EMF is negative delta phi over delta t. Remember, phi is the flux, or it's the magnetic field times the area. So if we break this down, we assume that the area is not changing because the loop isn't changing, nor the angle is. So we're going to see that this EMF is equal to the negative area times the changing magnetic field over the change in time. So what we have to realize here is first we have to get the area. And remember the area is pi r squared. So if it's a 0.96 diameter, uh, centimeter diameter, that's um, going to be point, uh, sorry, see now that should be 0 0.048. It's 9.6 divided by 100, which is 0 0.096 meters. Cut in half is 0 0.048 meters squared, so it's a pi r squared, that's our area. And the change in the magnetic flux is going to be um, final minus initial, so the final was zero as it was removed from the field, and the initial was 1.1 teslas. Um, again, notice a negative sign there, then it's going to be divided by 0.15 seconds. So if you calculate all that out, and the cor uh, it is correct that meters squared times tesla divided by second is a volt, we see our final answer is a 5.3 times 10 to the minus 2 volts. Now, interesting, uh, kind of a side note that goes through this, if you knew the resistance of the wire, and wire has a very low resistance, about 0 0.01 um, ohms uh, for a regular size piece of wire, you can actually even calculate the current induced in this wire here. So now we examine the case where we have a charged particle moving in, in an external magnetic field. 
So we see our force equation here is given as F equals QV cross B. Again, we have that um, cross product involved. Notice there is no force if the charge is not moving. If you just put a charge in a magnetic field, it won't move. Now this is contradictory to what happens in an electric field. An electric field will always accelerate a charged particle. Okay. Also, we see that the force, direction of the force here is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the direction of the charged particle. Again, kind of like the previous slide. So imagine the the current, because that's really what it is, the QV is, is a current for a single particle moving in one direction and the magnetic field in another. Even if they're not perpendicular to each other, those two force vectors create a plane and the magnetic force is perpendicular to that plane. Now we can also see that if this is combined with an electric field, the total force, or what they call the Lorentz force, is F equals Q parentheses E plus V cross B. And this ends up being very, very important because this is the fundamental process how um, originally cyclotrons and now these days particle accelerators work. They use the electric field to accelerate the charge and they use the magnetic field to control its direction. So now let's look at um, an example of force on a charged particle. We just went over the dynamics of it. This is also sometimes called the Lorentz force like we saw in the last part of our previous example here uh, down there at the bottom. So what is the velocity of a beam of electrons that un go undeflected when passing through a perpendicular electric and magnetic fields of magnitudes 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 3 volts per meter for the electric field and 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla for the magnetic field respectively. Um, so we want to know what is the radius of the electron orbit if the electric field is turned off. Now, um, it's important to realize that the fields are perpendicular to each other because then the forces will cancel each other out. Again, it says, uh, notice here, the force on the electron due to the electric force must be the same as the magnitude of the magnetic force. Otherwise, it would be deflected. And notice it says very specifically there, it's undeflected. So, Fe equals Fb. And remember that Fe is QE um, from the week one. And the magnetic force is QVB where V can then be solved for algebraically, notice that the charge cancels, as E over B. So now we get 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 3 volts per meter divided by 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla to give a value of 2.514 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Now, if we turn the electric field off, the magnetic force will cause circular motion, or the QV B F max equals mv squared over r. We realize here that this net force is equal to zero, so if we solve, um, we get we get qvb equals mv squared over r. Now a really neat trick you can do here is to just invert this equation, or one over qvb equals r over mv squared. Um, um, Notice at this point a V can cancel out, um, so that then makes it, so we get 1 over QB equals R over MV. Last step, we can multiply both sides by MV to get R equals MV over QB. Now, remember this was an electron, so we need to know the mass of the electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Our, there's our V value that we found in the first step, the 2.514 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Uh, Q, which is the charge of the electron, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then last but not least, multiply by our magnetic field, which is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla. All this giving a radius of curvature of 4.1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, or about 4.1 millimeters. Now this is a good problem because it gives us the basis of how most particle accelerators work. Usually they start with an electric field or a, a potential like a voltage to accelerate the particles and then they control the direction with magnetic fields. Uh, this is all done in a vacuum because you don't want your particles colliding with any gas molecules or anything like that. And then you can build your way upwards to more complicated uh, systems. They, they started first with cyclotrons and then went to synchrotrons and colliders from that. But Either way, this is a, a good start in an understanding of how they use these to control the motion of charged particles. So our next concept is the idea of what we call the electromagnetic induction. First, I want to talk a little about something we call flux. Magnetic flux 
is the product of a magnetic field and a aperture or hole of a certain area. Now depending on the angle between the magnetic field and the area of interest, it could either be the exact area or there could be an angular function, usually like a cosine involved. But for the most part, we'll just assume that it's, they're, they're nice and perpendicular to each other, so there's no issues. So then as it turns out, the, mag the magnetic field, if it's changing in time and somehow, I mean the flux is changing, will create a voltage, or an EMF, they call it, as follows. The EMF is equal to the negative change in the flux over the change in time. And this is actually called Faraday's Law. Now, like I said, the, the, the phi, and that's how that's pronounced, it's a Greek letter phi, or the magnetic flux is BA, where B is the magnetic field and A is the area that the field passes through. And also another thing to note is the negative sign. This is actually called Lenz's Law. What this signifies is that the induced voltage always opposes the changing magnetic flux. So if the field is increasing, you get a negative voltage. If the, or the flux is decreasing, you get a positive voltage. And the other thing to point out is you can change the flux in a couple different ways. You can make the hole bigger or smaller. You can change the magnetic field, or the most common way is you change the aperture size. And literally how they do this is you pass that magnetic field through basically what is the equivalent to a circle, and then you rotate that circle. And this actually is how almost all power production is created by spinning a magnet inside a coil of wire that then creates an induced EMF. Now, while we're on the topic of a changing magnetic flux, another very interesting point to talk about is something called a transformer. The transformers are a great device that either step up or step down the voltage, and also to realize when they're stepping up the voltage, they step down the current, and vice versa, meaning when they step down the voltage, they step up the current. I have a diagram here to the right that really shows these very well. So there's usually an iron core, and it's important that they use iron because it helps control the magnetic field lines, and usually have a primary coil um, of a certain number of wraps around the iron, and then you have a secondary coil. And now on this one, the secondary has fewer wraps, so this would be a step down, meaning the voltage would be lower. But it can be any variation. But the only kind you don't get is ones that have the same number of coils, because there's no point. Now one thing that's important here is they show how the magnetic flux goes around through the, the green part, is it's only a changing magnetic flux um, that will create uh, a flux in the other one, and thus a current in the other one. I meaning if you just run a, a normal DC current through the red coil here, it doesn't do anything in the blue. You have to have a changing. It has to induce that current in there. And again, it's, it always opposes the direction. Now, the other thing to point out is, because it's a play into the next slide, is the NP and the NS are the number of the primary and secondary coils. So continuing our lecture today and wrapping up, I want to finish a little bit more on transformers. Again, I want to look at the equations for stepping up and stepping down the current voltage here. The key point that what keeps this in control is no matter what's going on between the two coils of the transformer, power or the energy is dissipated per time has to be conserved. And the reason being is energy is always conserved. So as the voltage steps up, the current steps down. Or we see they behave as follows. The secondary voltage is equal to the primary voltage times the number of the secondary wraps over the primary. So if there's more in the secondary, you get more voltage. So if you have a primary of 100 coils and a secondary of 200, whatever the primary voltage is, the secondary voltage will always be twice that. Now for the current, we literally get the exact inverse, and that is the secondary current is equal to the primary times the number of the primary coils over the secondary. So by whatever factor the voltage increases, the current decreases, which is important because the power has to be the same. So if you were to do VSIS, that always has to equal VPIP. Well, that's it for this week. Again, please check out the other two lectures, and at any point, if you have any questions, email your instructor.